Before we begin our interview with Mortis, a word from our sponsor. Out this Halloween from Hospital Productions, The Old King of Witches, the new album of dark ambient music from Old Tower. Available on A5 Digipack CD, LP, and digital. Also available, the Grim Alchemy LP, which collects the 7-inch series and includes bonus material. The Plague Harvest tape issued on vinyl for the first time with bonus 10-inch and a double CD compendium collecting both, Tales of the Mad Moon. Furthermore, bundles are available with all three releases, plus a bonus tape, slip mat, Xerox poster, and the first issue of the hospital production zine, Beaten Face of the Oak Tree. Welcome to the world of Old Tower. For customers in the UK and Europe, exclusive colors, as well as select hospital titles, are available through Plastic Head.
You're listening to Noise Extra. I'm Gray Holger, here with my co-host Tara Connolly. Hello. And Mike Connolly. Hello. And our guest today is Havard Ellefson, uh, better known to probably everybody as Mortis. Hello. Hey. How is it going? Thank you so much for yes. doing this. We are very excited to speak with you. We always like to theme our the month of October properly, and we couldn't think of anyone else better to talk to than yourself. So thank you for taking the time to do this with us. Thank you. A lot of people that would be much better than me to talk to. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, we have some other great ones lined up, but this is pretty special for us Absolutely. as we've all been big fans of your music since the 90s through today. We all got a chance to see you in Los Angeles on the tour, the recent tour. And I guess maybe we'll just start with that. You okay. came back to what is commonly known as the era one era of Mortis. How did that, yeah. the return to era one begin? Well, I mean, it, it, it kind of happened gradually, I guess. Uh, I was, um, the, the guy that was putting together the, the Colmage Industry Festival back in, um, back in late, what, 20, 2017, was it? I believe so. In Stockholm, you know, there's sort of, sort of like the, the 30th um, anniversary thing, you know. Um, he asked me several times. I think he started kind of, kind of nagging me like back in 2016 or something like that about doing a show. And I was like, no, nah, there's no fucking way. <laughs> and uh, I, did, I just didn't feel like it, man. I mean, I was still very much in that sort of industrial rock mode, you know, that I had been in for a long time at that point. And, and uh, I just wasn't, I was just really uncertain about going back to, you know, something I hadn't really touched upon a lot for almost 20 years, but he, he kind of, he kept, he was pretty persistent, you know, so I guess every like four months he would just like message me like, Hey man, do you want to do it? And he, and he would increase the cash offer a little bit every time. <laughs> and we're just like, that's just the old trick, isn't it? You know, right. Just assuming that I'm broke, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but I mean, I didn't really care about the money that much, but I mean, at, at I think on his like third or fourth try, which was I guess in a spring or so of 2017, uh, we had decided uh, to put the band on a break because there had been so much negativity. It was just there was just no fun left in it, you know. So the band was kind of dissolving, and I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. And uh, so I think he just kind of hit it at the right time, you know. And, and he just one day messaged me, "Hey man, you know." do you want to reconsider this? And I thought about it and, and I'd been playing with the idea of putting the mask back on for the band. And I thought, well, fuck it, man. I mean, I'm kind of contemplating this partial return to at least the imagery of it. Might as well just fucking go all the way and do the music too. So that's, that's how that started. And, and the idea was to perform like an old cool meat album, you know? So I decided to do the second record on the Summit Opera, which was the first one I did for Call Me. And I guess five seconds after that, I just said, like, fuck, I'm not going to play the exact same thing. People have heard this so many times, you know, at least Call Me the Industry fans, or some of them will have heard that so many times already. But I just re-recorded the whole thing. And uh, that that happened across the summertime of 2017 and into the early fall uh, until that was completed. And, and by that point, I had um, come up with a lot of new music to add to the old stuff. And that's, it eventually became the Spirit of Rebellion album. You know, which is partially that we recorded on this with opera and then partially a uh, shit ton of new stuff. And right. yeah, and then went out and toured that for, for a long time after that. Yeah, the shows were incredible. The, the, the one we got to see. How did you originally link up with cold meat industry that must have been like back in 1994 i actually think my first album hadn't even come out yet i mean that was recorded in 93 but back in those days you know you signed with a label and they never had money so it was like literally i think they were saving up allowances to be able to <laughs> afford <laughs> printing them you know so it was like well my album was recorded a year ago and i think he's almost got enough cash to press the lp now right <laughs> so 
It took forever. So, so I think at one point I had three unreleased albums recorded just waiting to be released. You know, I was pretty quick with recording back in those days though. Um, so I think I sent like an advanced tape to Roger at Cold Meat because I was fascinated by that scene at, by that point, that whole really uh, kind of dark and disturbing, weird fucking industrial you know, it's a whole new universe. And it really kind of gelled with my black metal attitude. You know, there's a lot of things that kind of aligned with the way the way I looked upon the world and what, what fascinated me and interested me in, in, in art and music. So I wrote him and um, sent him the music and he wrote back and he said, like, I want to fucking sign this stuff. So wow. I was like, well, I had to release this somewhere else because I already had to deal with malicious records for the first album. But, you know, then I was I was already working on the second one by that point. So that moved pretty fast, you know. Um, I think Roger even had to wait until the first album came out so he could release the second one. So that might have created the illusion that I was putting out records really fucking fast, too. But they were already lined up because of the delay with the first one. But there was a pretty strong period of activity for you back then with Vaughn and and sort of later in the 90s, uh, Sinta, Sinta Celle Diavuli. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Nobody's saying it right. It's like it's Romanian. I'm saying it wrong. It's even misspelled. <laughs> I've had Romanian people tell me it's actually misspelled, and it's just very embarrassing. But, you know, I think people get – Romanian people basically know what it means, but apparently there, there's some bad grammar involved. I blame my girlfriend. She, she was from Romania. I guess she didn't know how to write. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We're really into the subjective nature of language here. All about what it means to you. Oh, you know, I mean, all I wanted was was for her to translate the devil's songs or the devil's music into Romanian because I was fascinated by vampires. So, of course, I was being very cliche. And the first thing you think about is Transylvania, of course. And I don't know. I guess she just grammatically kind of messed it up. Maybe she did it on purpose. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> How did you separate the projects back then and was there a difference in the sort of equipment you were using or where where they were destined for there were conceptual differences i mean there wasn't really a whole lot of um different equipment being used i wasn't really a big gearhead back in those days i had a couple of keyboards and like um this old sort of 60s filicorda organ that one was used for for a centicella devalui on some of the more experimental weird shit and uh, i would use tape loops as well for that because i had started um, hearing how, you know, these old like throbbing gristle, you know, non, um, cabaret Voltaire and all how those early industrial bands were doing some of their sort of pre sampler kind of, um, you know, sound effects and, and sound design. And it was, some of that stuff was based on tape loops and I'm sure that that probably again, inspired by Faust and those really early sort of Ashra temple, a Mount Duel and, and things like that, you know, but so I started fucking around. I had this, um, I had like, I think it was an Ampex. Um, I'm pretty sure it was an Ampex. I can't remember the model name. That was like an eight track, you know, seven inch tape reel. And I would start cutting up bits of tape and just loop that up. It was badly done too. I didn't know how to do it. So I used like scotch tape and I don't think that's the proper way to do it. And it was supposed <laughs> I to think, it, yeah, you know perfect. what, yeah. to me, that's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it wasn't exactly, those loops were anything but seamless. Let me, let me tell you that they were, they were, they were choppy, you know, and I think you're supposed to use like razor blades and you're supposed to cut like diagonally to make the transition more smooth and shit. Like I didn't have a clue. So I just sat there with like a kitchen scissor and just fucking cut up pieces of tape and then, you know, taped it back together with scotch tape and, and uh, ran it through the Ampex. And if you listen to Green Eyed Demon by Vaughn, that's all the backgrounds is basically that. I mean, that's basically just, shit that I've taken off a of TV or VCRs and into like a DAT player and then on through the Ampex and then, you know, with those loop effects. And it's that background, you know, it, it sounded pretty dark. And I did the same thing in Sintessa Javalui to some degree with, with other types of sounds. And so a lot of that strange shit that just kind of, that just sort of like uh, just exists in the background, you know, the loops, basically they're loops. They're, they are loops. That was all done using that little trick. You know, there was nothing new. I just, it was just something I read that those guys back in the seventies were doing. And I tried it out 20 years too late, you know? <laughs> I think that some of what gives it the, yes. the, the essence and that's what makes it so unique. 
I hate you. I hate your nation. And I hate your people. And I fuck your sons and daughters because they're pigs. You're a pig! You were inspired by the devil. Because you were inspired by the devil. The eyes of a girl seeking intercourse with the devil. you were inspired by the devil
because you were inspired by the devil? Yes. Because you were inspired by the devil? Yes. Jesus Christ forgave me bastards, but I can. When did you yeah. when did you even have the idea that you could just be a solo electronic artist? I think the concept of doing something solo was clear to me by the time I was um, an emperor. So that would have been like 90, 1992. I would have been aware of, uh, of the possibility of that. I mean, prior to emperor, I was more of a sort of, you know, I was at that point, I would have been really fucking young, like 15, you know. So I was, I was more of a fan at that point. I wasn't really considering how people made music. I was just listening to it at that point. By 92, I mean, you know, the whole black metal thing was was pretty much in swing. You know, we were a few bands getting into that. We were just investigating and discovering other avenues of music, like industrial music and, and electronically made music. And and um, a lot of that stuff is just uh, solo, you know. Maybe a couple of people, one guy, you know, Klaus Schulze was like sort of the perfect example of that. He's not an industrial artist, but I mean, he's one of those old, pioneers of electronic German electronic music, you know, oh, Berlin absolutely. school, I suppose it became known as later on. Crowd rock by the Dom Brits. Edgar Frosa hated that expression apparently. He <laughs> thought it, it, it was it was a, but it's a crowd, it's like a sausage, isn't it? <laughs> so they're basically called like sausage rock. <laughs> 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 Or I don't like think I ever really put that something. together, I mean, but I guess yeah, it's sauerkraut. Yeah, cabbage. It's yeah. it's cabbage rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, um, because apparently they eat that or ate that in Germany. So these fucking British people, I mean, you know, they just called it that. And that's kind of like an <laughs> offense, isn't it? So um, anyway, I mean, once you become aware of guys like Klaus Schulz or even, you know, Jauni from his slaughter natives, right? a lot of those climate industry acts, you know, Boyd, even Boyd Rice, guys like that, they all did it on their own. So it became clear to me that you don't have to be four guys to make music, which was a good thing because, you know, I got fired from Emperor like the week after. So, <laughs> so you know, I, I had to do something and I was like, well, I can do this. Like, it's like mm-hmm. I walked down to my music store and I bought a keyboard. You know, I, I didn't realize that all those dudes either had like a fucking arsenal of keyboards and, and sort of sound modules, you know, and various creative ways of creating cool sound. I thought it all came out of keyboards. That was a huge misunderstanding. You know, I couldn't figure out how the fuck they made it sound so great, but, but my keyboard didn't sound nearly as cool. It took a while for me to realize how they did that stuff. What was your, what was that first keyboard? I was like one of those entry level ones. Um, it's a Roland uh, JV30. You know, it's become like I see people talk about that keyboard a lot and, and you know, in more recent sort of dungeon synth forums, simply because my albums are so early in that scene and they're wondering where the sounds come from. They're straight out of that fucking keyboard. There's nothing specially done to them, like some reverb and echo, maybe. And that's about it. So it's no big secret. Before we continue our interview with Mortis, a word from our sponsor. Oxen Records. Peter J. Wood's Collages, C30, created through reimagined texts and sounds from works written between 2012 to 2019. Unsustainable Social Condition, Rapid Polarization 2, C20, follow-up to 2019's Rapid Polarization on Foul Prey, Brutish Feedback and Frayed Layers of Havoc. Circuit Wound, a sudden lapse of concentration CD, J. Howard's decades-long harsh noise project abuses with sheets of gnarled, hellacious onslaught. Scathing, a capital beneath the waves, CD. Mutilated feedback, vigorous distribution of American noise, plowing through all guardrails, unhinged swirl of limbs. Out now at oxen-label.com. Established in 1990, Cold Spring is the UK's premier label, specializing in new and rediscovered industrial and esoteric music, such as Coil, Psychic TV, Mertzbau, MZ412, FM Einheit of Einsters and Neubauten, Trepanierings Ritualen, Burial Hex, Sleep Research Facility, Zoskia, film soundtracks, and much more. You can find our large mail-order catalog at coldspring.co.uk or in the USA via forcedexposure.com. Oh, no. 
mentioning Dungeon Synth, of course, uh, sort of between when you started and and uh, sort of the Era 1 period and your comeback, uh, an entire bastion of musicians have been inspired by your work and your style and, and dark dungeon music, right? Dungeon Synth. How does that feel? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's okay. Um, I, I've been getting that question, I guess, for a, a handful of years now, and I, I was kind of humbled by it and probably a little confused by it a couple of years ago because I, 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 to me, it never felt like I did anything that was that special. You know, I just sat down and I, without a clue, I, I've never been like a big, I've never been a good musician technically or even theoretically. I just have ideas and uh, a lot of passion, you know, and, and especially back in the, in, in my younger days, you know, when you have that sort of youthful energy and you just fucking, you love doing that and it feels new and fresh and, and you're really kind of excited about it. That, But that was about as far as it went. It wasn't like I sat there and, you know, thought to myself wow i'm 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 inventing the, the gunpowder all over again i'm reinventing <laughs> the wheel you know and 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 i didn't i never did that you know but maybe some people think that i don't know but it's it's i thought it was a bit weird when i got the question you know the, the first few times a few years back you know how does it feel that you know to have inspired a bunch of people and of course it's it's great i mean it's it's uh, flattering and I, I i'm glad they like that stuff i mean i spent um, many many years not really liking my old output that had more to do with me being very self critical and uh, mixing that up with with a pretty deep depression that i was coping with for a while that i'm out of now more or less so that's just a whole different part of the story but yeah. you know I, I mean it's cool i'm, I'm glad i meant they mentioned me as their inspiration rather than just not rather than just ignoring me i guess yeah i think that's something that was so exciting when i first heard your music was that it, it you weren't trying to showcase like Hey, look! I can play the piano better than anyone else, or like, I have the best equipment. It's it's using because I can. Yeah, it's, it's 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 using your own ideas and thoughts and feelings to create something, and it's and it's not entirely, you know, self aware. And I and I just absolutely love that. Um, and so I found it really expi- inspiring to not, you know, let all of those things in your head of what you should be trip you up from doing what you want to do. But did you have? any musical training because in my mind you're know, an incredible you yeah. player no 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 that was one of the reasons i didn't like my old output because all i could hear were the mistakes i was making and i, I wasn't able to get my mind past the things i thought i did wrong so i had a hard time listening to the well everything i did in 90s i had a hard time listening to that for at least 10 years maybe 15 years because what happened you know after a while around the time of the stargate naturally after the stargate when i started working on the smell of rain album i had to teach myself programming i didn't know programming for i i, I made several albums not having a clue what programming was. I was aware of sequencers because they were mentioned all over those Tangent Dream records and the Kraftwerk albums. I mean, there's all, you know, all the ARP sequencers and the Oberheims and all that stuff that they were using. I didn't have a fucking clue what they were. It's, it sounded cool. And, and I knew they were used in electronic music. And eventually I understood that they make your music sound tight and on grid. Well, that's their basic function, you know. So eventually I realized that's something I had to learn. That's when I started realizing that what a shitty job I thought I had done on the previous stuff. Because that's all that stuff is played live with, with mistakes mm-hmm. and, and sloppy fucking, sometimes very sloppily played. But I guess that's part of the charm. That's why I still like fucking Hellhammer, you know. It's not exactly professional music. Right. Mm-hmm. Or the early Sodom stuff that came out. It sounds like an avalanche, man, you know. But it's <laughs> awesome, you know. Do you play through MIDI now and use sequencing? Yeah, I mean, I've been doing that since since back in, in the sort of, uh, you know, back in the Kurzweil days, days when, when I was just, would just program into that little screen on the K2000. And then I s- switched over to Mac and Cubase, you know, a long, long time ago. And mm-hmm. so, I mean, usually what I do is I'll, I'll record stuff live into the sequencer and then, you know, um, most of the time what I'll just do is I'll just drop the notes into the grids where they need to go. There's all kinds of ways to make it sound dynamic. I mean, that sounds like it just sounds rigid and stiff, but I mean, you can do various dynamic processes to it, like velocity and, you know, shuffle it a little bit. And you can, you can, you can move it back and forth between the grid lines as well. It doesn't have to be on the actual grid all the time. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and then all kinds of other fucking shit, you know, like LFOs and, and uh, dynamic processing, you know, various shit that you can do. It doesn't have, oh, you can just leave all that out and, and pretend like you sound like Kraftwerk, which you, you'll you never sound like Kraftwerk because they actually groove a lot more than you would think. But, you know, people think they're rigid, but I thought they were fucking groovy. I saw them live, man. It was, it, it was rocking. When did you, uh, when did you oh, see Kraftwerk? That was like five or six years ago. I think I was the only guy that probably ever almost got into a fight at a craft work show. <laughs> wow. I don't, know, I don't know if that's possible. An <laughs> <laughs> asshole was just like, he, he just, I don't know. It was just like, fuck, I almost got into a fight. because, and, and that was a sit down show too. I mean, that's like, that's like fist fighting at the opera. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> It was, it was, it's just some guy with a big mouth. And I was like, oh, fuck you, man. You know, and uh, it, it, we didn't get into a fight. It was, felt like it was about to happen. Probably a good thing I didn't know. I think, I think I saw Kraftwerk around the same time as I saw you on the Stargate tour. They, uh, they came through where right. I was living in Detroit cool. at the time. And, uh, and you played with Christian Death on that tour, right? Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Christian had Death and Godhead. Um, and there was one more band, which was actually the band of uh, Christian Death's uh, tour manager, I think. So that was, I don't know if that was his payment or something. He got to play. <laughs> on the tour. But that was the, was that the first time that you did Mortis as a band, the Stargate tour? Yeah. I mean, you could say that, you know, I mean, it was a live, a uh, live lineup. Um, none of the, I mean, Sarah was on the album as well, obviously Eric and Frederick, uh, the two uh, percussion guys, they were not on that record, but I mean, I'd known them since back because those guys are from the cold meat sort of scene, you know, Frederick has a project called no festival of light, uh, out of Gothenburg. And, um, Eric was a part of that. And Frederick was also the live percussionist for order equilibrio, which were signed with, uh, CMI back, well, they were called Ordo Equilibrio at the time. They right. extended the name to Ordo Rosarius Equilibrio, I think. Yes. After a while. I was really good friends with Thomas, you know, and Frederick and all those guys. So, so I knew they were around and I would we'd done some shows together back when I was in my really early live days, like 96, 97, when I was doing it solo. We kept doing shows with Ordo, you know, and so Frederick was always there. So I knew he was a cool live percussion guy. And sometimes they would do no festival of light uh, shows as well. And then you'd, I would uh, get, get to know Eric. So eventually I just like went, fuck man. I mean, Stargate is kind of like, it's got some percussive elements and it would be cool to recreate that live. So I got those guys to, to join in. Sarah was on board already, you know, cause she was on the album. So um, yeah, it's just a matter of like knowing people, you know. There was also a theatrical element to that performance. I remember a sort of a sacrifice on stage. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did stuff like that. Yeah. That was, uh, that was my girlfriend at the time, actually. And, uh, she actually lived in Detroit, believe it or not at the time she was an American girl. So, uh, she, she got sacrificed every night. Um, you know, and every, pretty much every day we'd have to go out and buy new meat, you know, cause you can't bring that with you after the show i mean that shit rots man it's like <laughs> smell really bad you know <laughs> i mean we did forget like a couple of pieces of meat in uh in um in a plastic container in the back of the van and you know after a couple of weeks we couldn't figure out what the fucking stench was oh <laughs> like you oh my know, god I mean, did it explode well it, it it had gone green you know, when oh. we finally emptied out the van, we were cleaning it out like you do like every couple of weeks on tour just to get all the shit out, you know, and vacuum the whole thing. And just, just kind of like try not to live in a disgusting, fucking horrible vehicle. Um, we found that little plastic container and it's, we, we, oh shit, this is what smells. And we <laughs> open it and it was like that fucking movie Evolution. You remember that movie? Yeah, you know, yeah, with yeah. the guy from the X-Files? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, like it, was, 90s, it was. Yeah. It looked like fun. It was like fungi. It was this green swampy shit that just grown out of the meat. It was like a little forest. <laughs> and it just, it was the worst smell I've ever. It was like two weeks rotten meat. You know. Oh, gross. Fucking bad, man. Yeah. Oh. Terrible. <laughs> you know, another one of my sort of uh, introductory points to you was something I still 
enjoy watching to this day is the VHS that you released through Cold Meat Industry. Oh, that that thing uh, in, in the fortress in a castle. Yeah. How did you find that, and how did you set that all up? <laughs> I mean, that started as as me wanting to have a video backdrop for my shows because obviously, when you're the only guy on stage, there's a limit to how much action you can have on that stage. I mean, you know, in, in terms of like how much movement and how much exciting. How exciting can you be as being one guy? So uh, I wanted more movement and I figured like, well, a live video backdrop, which was kind of like, that was a pretty ambitious project back in, I think this is 97. It wasn't quite as easily done as it is today. You can use, today you, you, you can, you can sync up your video, you know, through MIDI with, um, one of those fucking pro I, the one I used, I forgot what it's fucking called now, but they're basically VJ programs and they're all like internally synchronized to like Ableton Live and things like that, you know, and, and you can program your video basically. That's what I've done recently. Um, back in those days, it was a matter of like bringing a tape, a VHS tape and hoping the guy would press play at the same time as your show starts, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Fingers crossed. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That was uh, kind of like, oh, well, oh, he hasn't started the fucking thing yet. The show's halfway done. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was that was how that started. And um, and Roger said, hey, man, I'll pay for it if I can release it. So it wasn't really my initial idea, like I said, was was wasn't actually to create like a home video or anything. It was actually just for me to have as a as the moving backdrop. But Roger, I think the thing was Roger offered to pay for it if he could release it. So uh, that was kind of like a win-win. And that was filmed in a fortress out, right outside of Gothenburg. I lived in a place called Halmstad, which is further down on the southwest coast of Sweden. Gothenburg is on the southwest coast, and Halmstad is a bit further south, closer to Denmark in that sense, um, about two hours from, from Gothenburg. So it was just a matter of get going up there for a day and, and um, working with a video guy and, and walking around. You know, it's not... It's not the most happening video, you know, it's more more like a tour of a castle, you know, but it was cool for the time. I still think it's pretty atmospheric, you know.
That's very oh, atmospheric. Yeah. Yeah. It's like still, we still watch it to this day. Yeah. Every you, day you watch every it. Every day we watch it. <laughs> it's actually, we wake up and it's just the first thing and then the yeah. last thing at yeah. night. Just and right on just, the ceiling. For the past 20-some yeah. years. In the ceiling, in the bedroom. All yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. it never goes away. You were also... You were also <laughs> on the Brighter Death Now album Necros Evangelicum. Did you go in the yeah, studio and work okay, with them? I've forgotten about that. Oh, I mean, as far as I know, Brighter Death Now is, at least back in those days, that was Roger Carmonic from, you know, the owner of Call Me. That was his project. Mm. And I think he had that since almost before he started the label. It's, it's a pretty old project by now. Uh, and that's actually how I discovered uh, Cold Mint Industry. There was an interview with Brother Death now in Slayer Mag back in like 1991. Oh, you know? wow. That's, that's cool. cool. I didn't know they were like, ever in that. That's cool. Yeah. No, 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 no. He was interviewed in that. And there was a, it was a fucking great photo of Roger. He was sitting in a couch with what looked like bleeding eyes. And I thought, that's fucking dark, man. And nobody in black metal had thought about that little, which was weird because we were into the whole, you know, visual fucking thing i mean obviously you know so so I, that was very very uh appealing to me so that's how i contacted him uh, going back to the earlier question but right um as far as uh the, the collaboration there uh no i recorded that at home on on that ampex a track that i was talking about you know the one that i did the tape loops on yeah i also wow. did more north recordings on it you know like regular songs and shit like that i didn't know how to use it i'm, I'm surprised i got sound to stick on the tape to be honest <laughs> uh, it was just a matter of figuring stuff out even even just just threading that fucking tape through those little fucking wheels you know on the upside and the underside it was just kind of like how the fuck does this work and no i mean roger knew that i was recording and uh, working on music and he just asked me like hey can you create like a sort of uh, atmospheric sort of, uh, you know, musical pad, you know what I mean? Just yeah. something mm -hmm. atmospheric and dark that just kind of goes in the background. And that's what I did. And I I guess I, I created a couple of minutes of that. And I, I probably just put it down on the DAT tape. I think I had a DAT recorder by that point, like a Tascam DA, what, 20 or something like that. Uh, one of those black ones, a rack unit. And I probably just mailed it to him. And uh, he was happy with it. And um, you know, next thing I know, I'm on his record, which was cool. You know, I think some of those uh, sort of pioneer industrial dudes probably didn't like that because, you know, I was his newcomer, you know, and I wasn't really, I was probably, I think some people looked at me as a rather commercial artist, you know, and uh, and then I sold a lot more than most of those guys did too. So I think they were pissed off, I guess. I think so. <laughs> I mean, they're probably not pissed off anymore, but I mean, you know. I'm this fucking guy out of the metal scene and I just fucking sort of like roll in there and I sell quite a lot of records back then. And I can see why they got pissed off. <laughs> but I feel that you've in so many ways throughout your entire body of work, you bridge a lot of different genres, a lot of different ideas and bring a lot of different stuff to the table. For example, I read that, one of the inspirations for those Crypt of the Wizard 12 inches was your love of the Sisters of Mercy 12 inches. And you wanted to create a series inspired by that. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. I mean, I, I, I've been a record collector for since I was a kid. Obviously, there was a, a point in time where I discovered goth music. You know, um, I'm sure Andrew Eldritch would, would want to shoot me if he heard me call Sisters Goth. Right, I'm, right. From what I understand, that's the last thing he wants to hear. And the cure is goth, too. <laughs> and I don't think Robert Smith wants to hear that. <laughs> from what I understand. But uh, no, 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 no. I So I started, you know, back in those days, you could still go to the record stores. You know, back in the mid-90s and, and the early 90s, you could still go to record stores, like secondhand record stores. And you could, you'd, you'd find all of these 12 inches and they would cost like four or five dollars, you know, because everybody were moving on to CD. The fucking idiots. I would buy like fucking dozens of records every week, you know, and and because it, it didn't cost a lot of money. And uh, and I started realizing like all these sisters, 12 inches. I mean, they're so uniform. It's like fucking it's the same thing. And you, you could spot one like 100 yards away. You'd know it was a Sisters of Mercy 12 inch, you know, or an album. So I thought that was fucking awesome. And, um, you know, once I started uh, putting my 12 inches out, which was directly, obviously directly inspired by sisters, I just wanted 12 inches out because I hadn't done it. 
It was it was an ego trip, needless to say. You know, I just want to do what they did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it felt like a huge fucking project though at the time to self released five fucking twelve inches. You know, and they cost twelve feet to throw. But I yeah, but I did it eventually. It took took a couple of years. Yeah, they're not any cheaper than an LP. Well, that's the thing. I mean, they cost, from what I recall, they cost exactly the same amount of money to press as an album. Yeah. But you couldn't sell it for the price of an album because there's only two songs, right? So you, you got to lower your price a lot. So you sell it for about half the price of an album, you know, so you're not really making any money. So it was it was really just like a big sort of egoistical, uh, a, a, bit, a bit of an insane project, really, because there was really no money. It, it was never about the money, but it's always nice to make your money back, you know, so you, yeah. you can put it into the next thing that you want to do, you know. And, but I guess I, I guess I did make it back. I can't remember if I lost or anything. It didn't really matter. You know, it was just something I wanted to do. Uh, you know, when I set my mind to something, then I kind of never give up on it. So, and you, that was when you were releasing stuff yourself. Yeah. Dark Dungeon Music. Yeah. Which, and I guess yeah. that's where the whole Dungeon Synth term came from, you know, years down the line. I'm assuming, I mean, I could be wrong, but I mean, it would be <laughs> weird if it wasn't taken from that. <laughs> I, if I was a betting man, I would yeah. go ahead and just throw. <laughs> Money it's a pretty that. safe bet. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you. 
talk about the visual aspect being so important. Clearly, with Mortis, it's incredibly important. Where did that seed come from for you to feel that vi the visual side is a, an incredibly important side to the project? It all started with me as a kid being into Kiss. You know, that's 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 the story. I think most um, everybody my age doing any kind of any kind of hard rock metal or, or, or visual expressionism, whatever you want to call it, that has a past in hard rock is going to say that, you know, hey, man, Gene Simmons, you know, yeah. love the guy or hate the guy. I mean, it seems like a bit of a dick, but, you know, I mean, they created Kiss, man, and that had a huge fucking impact, you know, and I still think their 70s music was fucking awesome. And uh, even though it became very cartoonish, I can live with that. I don't fucking care. You know, the visual aspect of Kiss was was absolutely enormous and it it, it um, shaped me as a little kid. I mean, that made me look for more stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, eventually I found Wasp, you know, around the first album. And I thought, like, this is fucking even crazier. They don't have as much makeup. They look even more fuck. They look like fucking murderers, you know. I thought that was fantastic. And uh, and I was aware of Alice Cooper, but he was a little bit too early for me. It was a little harder to catch, you know. Like, my mom started talking to me about Alice Cooper when she realized what I was into. And she was like, because he had just made his comeback with the Constrictor album back in, I think, 85. And so she was aware of that for some reason, even though they were like blue people, you know, but he was like, this guy, you had to check him out. You know, I didn't. Um, Cause that was, I, Alice Cooper was, it wasn't for me at the time. It's now I prefer Alice Cooper over Kiss musically. I mean, I think it's fucking genius, you know, but it was all about the visual impact, you know, so Kiss and Wasp and, you know, a few years down the line, you get Venom, you get the early, all those early thrash metal band like, bands, like even Slayer looked fantastic back in the old days. You know, I'm sure they will disagree. I mean, they, they changed their image pretty fast. But I mean, I thought they, they were fucking kick-ass, you know, on Early Destruction, Sodom, Celtic Frost. All those bands were like very visual. So I was completely into that. Then I got into books like Lord of the Rings, which, uh, you know, uh, in itself is not visual, but the visuals in your mind are absolutely stunning. And, and black metal, of course, around the same time, which is a lot about the visual aspect of, of you know, just the atmospherics of it has a lot to do with visual presentations. So that so that it's, it's just a big sort of mishmash of, of, of all that stuff. And, and once I'd left Emperor, I thought, well, where, what can I do now? You know, I knew, I knew, I decided that I was going to play like really dark atmospheric keyboard music. I wanted to take the visual aspect of it beyond black metal. And I think it took me a couple of days to come up with this idea. Well, fuck, man, I'll, 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 I'll build something. I'll build a fucking face, you know? So we used fucking blue tech, man. Cause we, <laughs> wow. didn't, we didn't, we didn't have anything else. There was, I didn't have a Hollywood guy, you know, next door with a, with a big sort of like, I'll, I'll cast your face. I'll build you a fucking, mm -hmm. I'll make you look like fucking uh, something really Scott would have fucking uh, felt that that wasn't happening. You know, it was like, well, what's in the kitchen? What do we have in the kitchen? So, well, we have blue tack. We can shape that into something. So, so we did that. Me and my girlfriend, she helped me out. And what we realized immediately was that it's very, it's very hard to put makeup on blue tack because it's got that sort of oily finish to it. So the makeup doesn't stick. So that was a hard job. But those really early mortis photos with the helmet and the chain mail and the axe and all that stuff, that's basically hours after inventing the mortis face you know oh, from wow. the photo from the, the, the photo That's from the first wild. album yeah probably the same day because it was like we came up with it and then straight into photo shoot you know which was i think in her bedroom <laughs> with black sheets on the walls you know <laughs> you, you you take what you've got you know and and you just run with it and next time you do better so uh eventually what i would do was i would cut out pieces of plastic bottles and shape them as nails and paint them black and glue them out to my face. If you see those mortis photos with the really long nails. Right. Yeah, of course. Yeah. That's Coke bottles. <laughs> wow. You shape them into nails, right? You, yeah. you just shape them because they're naturally Shoots bent. Up, up yeah. By the yeah. Wow. So I, 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 used, I remember I sat down, I looked at a bottle once. I'm like, I could fucking do something. That's got a natural curve that that could turn into like really creepy long nails, you know? So I just bought like nail polish and painted them. Mortis is true DIY. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, oh, you, you know, you, when you never have any money, you, you can you can be pretty fucking inventive, man. What did the facial makeup and prosthetics, what did that eventually become when you had to be more consistent with shows, et cetera? For the first couple of shows, we actually, I think we might have used blue tag for the first couple of shows. I'm not sure. That was very hit and miss. Sometimes that didn't work out too well. Uh, but eventually I, I did get to know a guy that was sort of like, um, like a hobby uh, SFX kind of guy mm-hmm. or he was just a little bit more resourceful than me. He might've been a, just like me and just a bit more handy, but he was able to sort of cast my nose and ears. So I had these really primitive sort of um, some sort of latex styled appendages. Is that the word for it? Yes. Yep. And, you know, I would just get like theater glue, which is what I still use though, you know, for those appendages and just put that on. But that never looked quite as good to me for some reason. And, um, um, so that lasted a couple of years. That would have been the sort of crypt of the wizard period. And then you get into the Stargate, and that's when I really sat down and made a decision to sink a whole bunch of money into it and have proper care. I went out to Burbank. I found oh. an ad in Feng- and a Fangoria magazine. I feel like, well, where's the place you can find people that knows how to do this? I actually went to Gothenburg, which is the only place they would sell Fangoria mags or Gore mags. And I bought a few of them. I just went through the ads. I found this place in Burbank uh, called the LA Makeup Designery, I think they were called. Still, They're still around. I was talking to them just before the pandemic. I was going to go to their New York because they have a New York office now or like a New York lab or whatever. Yeah. And I was going to get some new masks done. And then, you know, the next day the world fucking started dying. So I guess that's that's for later. That's not going to happen for a while. But so I, I flew over in 99 and worked with them, you know, had a casting made and we designed the whole face together. And uh, that's the one I've been using ever since. Do you only have one, one version of the face? No, no, there's been a, quite a few made because uh, they were made of uh, um, uh, some kind of like a very light, I think they call it foam latex. Um, it weighs very little, um, mm-hmm. but it can also crack up and, and um, you could tear that thing apart. No problem, you know. So sometimes when I've taken it off after a show, especially if for some reason it's been cold on stage, that glue turns into fucking concrete. Ooh, I bet. Um, then it gets a lot rougher to take off. And so sometimes you kind of rip it a bit. So so mm-hmm. I've had quite a few of them. It's probably 15 or 20 in existence or, well, might be. They might be ruined for all that. I've, I've given some away and I've sold a few and... Um, some I probably lost. I think one or two were stolen at some point. Um, so um, that's that's actually one of the reasons I was talking to them recently about getting more made up. I still have a couple, obviously, but it's getting pretty rough. How long does it take to get into the makeup and mask? When I've done it a few times, I can do that shit in half an hour. If I was going to put one on now, I would give myself an hour at least. I haven't done that in a while, you know. Mm-hmm.
after Stargate, we get the smell of rain. How, yeah. and it's clearly a very different avenue you're taking. When did you have the idea that you were going to change things up? I probably started feeling a little, I mean, I think I mentioned earlier that I was, uh, I was struggling with a depression style of feeling worthless. I mean, I don't know if it would be diagnosed. I never went to a doctor for it, but I felt like shit and I hated everything. And especially everything that I had done, I thought it was fucking useless and worthless. So, so I think that that's, that state of mind started to make itself known around the time I was making the Stargate. So by the time, by the time I was touring the Stargate, I was actually feeling like, fuck, this isn't really what I want to do. Um, I mean, I had a good time touring it. And when you're on stage, you're, you're, you're into what you're doing. And I was happy with the shows and, and all that, all of that. But ultimately I wanted to do something else. So, I mean, you know, for the second half of the nineties, I had, uh, gotten into a lot of the old hard rock stuff that I grew up with. Uh, I was still into a lot of electronic music. I had gotten started to really understand stuff like Skinny Puppy, Ministry, and Nine Inch Nails, and things like that. And, and um, I felt like I was a little late to that game. But what I did realize about that type of music, especially Ministry, I guess is the best example, is how you can easily combine the two things that you really love, which were which is like heavy, aggressive guitars and electronics and i was like fuck i could do that that would fucking save me because i was so depressed i wanted to fucking quit making music at one point you know because i wasn't i didn't know what i I, th I thought i sucked you know i was i was probably very confused in terms of where i was going what i had done and my value and 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 uh, you know in the world of music and then i discovered that and i'm like shit man i mean i grew up on hard rock music that's natural to me and i really love this whole universe of experimentalism that you know and, and all the inventiveness of electronic music and samples and things like that so that was kind of a revelation when i realized that was possible so that's when I started making the spell of rain. I, and I always wanted that record. But I didn't know how to make that music. So like I said, I had to teach myself how to use sequencers and things like that. And that's probably, I guess it's a happy accident, but that's why uh, the smell of rain is as melodic and soft, so to speak, as it is. I always wanted it to be much more angry and hard, but I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know those tricks of layering and distortion and just putting fucking, you know, put your drums through like a million different pedals and it'll sound fucking insane. I didn't know any of that. I didn't know how they, how they did it. So um, I was trying my way and um, it came out much softer and, and sort of um, sadder than I really wanted it to. But looking back, and I've said this for a long time, I think that's a really happy accident. I don't think that album should have sounded any other way. So I'm I'm glad I didn't ruin it with with a lot of distortion layers. I did that on the grudge, you know, that came later. It sounds like the way Smell of Rain came out reflected where you were at in your life at that time. I yeah, I totally did. Yeah. I was I was basically looking back, I was probably just very sad for some reason. You know, like I was grieving something I still don't understand. That's the way the whole album comes across to me. Like, shit, I was really sad about something, you know. Um, then I got really angry the next couple of years for some reason. Uh, probably, well, I, I know I know, I know, know some of the reasons, but I mean, that's because I got fucked over so much in the music industry. I was getting really pissed off and tired of that. So that, that reflects itself on the Grudge album. But yeah, on The Smell of Rain, which I still consider that to be basically my most important album because it really kind of saved me. It, it did show me that this is what I want to do. You would go through the 2000s with a band. Yeah. And how did those guys come together? Well, I mean, there were a few guys. When, when I made The Smell of Rain, it was, it was by and large a solo album. I mean, Sarah Diva was uh, also on that record. She wasn't like in the band or anything like that. She was just a person I enjoyed working with. And, and you know, so I brought, I wanted to bring some of the elements of the 90s with me. And, and, and then and that was basically Sarah, you know. Because I thought she'd done such a fucking great job on the Stargate and she really added that great organic feel. So I thought, well, that's going to work on whatever I do, you know. So I brought that element with me. Everything else is pretty much different. Um, then I had um, a guy called Osmond to play the bass guitar on, on The Smell of Rain. He actually became 
an early guitar player later on in the live band. But I mean, beyond that, and and of course, you know, and this this was actually a secret for a long, long time. But the guitar player on the Smell of Rain is Chris Amott out of Old Arch Enemy, uh, from you know Michael Amott and, and those guys. And he could never be officially credited because of some contractual shit. So uh, uh, that's that's something we all forgot. And they, Arch Enemy is like a huge band now, you know. But Chris is no longer, and I think he quit like 10 years ago. Um, he's Michael Amos' brother. And I'm not sure what he's doing these days, but he was a good friend of mine back in those days who lived in the same town. But of course, he wasn't in the band or anything. He was just on the record. The band was formed probably around 2002 with, um, with members that were pretty much replaced by the time we started working on The Grudge in 2003 and 2004. Uh, Levy had joined the band and he would remain with the band until the bitter end, so to speak. And and Leo was a drummer and he was a drummer for a while. Osman was still there as the guitar player. But those guys were, everybody except for Levy were switched out after a couple of years through. We're still friends, but at the time it was, we we didn't match. At one point, I wanted everything to be so distorted and saturated in noise and dirt because I was so pissed off. I didn't want anything to be normal in the music. I guess some of those guys didn't see why does everything have to be fucking, <laughs> <laughs> which is a valid question. But you know, it but it, it was like, well, it's my band, you know. So so they quit, you know, or <clears throat> they were asked to leave. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, I fired people a lot at one point, I think, you know. She's still dying. 
Eventually, one of the last things to come out of this era would be some great remixes and some of those remixers being Merzbau, mm. Prurient. Yeah. How did those remixes come about and how did you decide to really go with some of the most extreme noise and experimental music to remix your music i mean the album that we're talking about the, the original material is exists on the great deceiver album right and by that point you know this is a couple of albums down the line that we're talking now by that that was by that point i had already gotten one or two remix albums out so that was that was an idea that i liked sending your stems out or your sub mixes or your tracks you know out to other artists that you like and see what they can do to your music you know it's just an interesting concept i mean it's there's also a certain sense of risk in it like there could always be there, there's always a chance that what what comes back you don't like and then you have to tell this artist or this band that you respect and love that um this this sucks <laughs> you know <laughs> i was always really nervous whenever a remix would would you know sort of dump into the mailbox so to speak and like and i, was, I would put it on like god i hope i like it <laughs> um but thankfully i pretty much always did there, there might have been like one or two remixes uh, not on that the album that we're talking about now. But some of the really early stuff where I got the stuff back and I was like, oh shit, I don't know. And I didn't have the guts to tell them. And I, we just put it out. I was like, ah, oh, I'm just going to pretend that it doesn't exist. <laughs> but, uh, but, but with the album that you were talking about that, you know, that ended up being called The Great Corruptor. Right. Um, which is a bit of a wordplay on The Great Deceiver, you know, you I don't know the cheap wordplay. I just like I just like the line "great corruptor" because it's basically the devil, isn't it? You know, I like that. Yeah. I always liked say, but it was it was you know um, that was a project that initially started as as a reissue of the Great Deceiver with a couple of extra bonus tracks, where I just well okay I'll just ask a couple of guys to remix it, but then it just grew. All of a sudden, you have guys like John Fryer and. Reese Falber, you know, and Mersbo, um, and fucking Godflesh, you know, oh, and yeah. Slaughter Natives. And just like, <clears throat> I think literally we had like 25 remixes all of a sudden. And it was just, I just, um, 
I just really enjoyed the process. So I kept sending, you know, I kept contacting these various artists, you know, just checking in and like, hey, do you want to do a remix? And uh, and Merspo was, I think, one of those guys that I just like, hey, hang on. He's been around for absolutely ever. I've always known about him since the cold meat days. And I don't know him, but I mean, fuck it, man. And he's like a noise artist. That's different. Uh, from most of the other stuff that I have on 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 this album so far, you know, even though some of the cold meat artists are, they can be pretty dark and noisy themselves. You know, Japanese noise, I suppose, is a little bit in a league of its own. Oh, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. So I thought that was it was just a it was just a thought that just entered my head. You know, you know, one of those one of those days, you know, I just get this idea like, fuck, yeah, let's try that. Why didn't I think of that before? You know, I heard back and he wanted to do it and. um I think he was a little bit unsure about, I'm not sure if he had done remixes before or if, if the concept was a little bit outside of what he normally does. From what I understand, my song was simply put through the sort of um, sound audio mutilating process that he does. And I thought that was very fucking cool. You know, it sounds so good. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That it came out dark. It's it's when I heard, it, I was like, this is uneasy listening, man. But the more I hear it, the better it gets. It's one of those that kind of progressively just grows on you. Yeah. You know, we put that out as its own download single. And uh, Chris Rana, you know, the old uh, Nine Inch Nails drummer, he was mm-hmm. on there. I mean, I've worked with him a bit and um, he did a really cool remix. There was a lot of great fucking people on there, like a lot of good names. It's, and they it's all turned deep. out great.
And then we get to, as referenced earlier in the episode, Spirit of Rebellion. Somewhat of a reworking of the second record with new elements. It's, it really plays completely like a new mm-hmm. album. I felt that way too. I, I started realizing that as I was making it, I'm like, it feels like I'm making a new record, you know, not a hundred percent true because I was drawing from source material, but at the same time, it feels like I'm doing this. Um, it's like, this is what I wanted it to sound like in 1994, but I didn't know how to make that happen. So, so it felt right to do it. Like I was doing it some kind of justice, you know, so you, you took a lot of what you learned in the 2000s and applied it to this recording. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's basically a, a sort of a DIY. I mean, I, I never took it to a studio. It's very much in the box. You know, it's, I don't think there's any hardware almost at all involved with that record. It's uh, pretty much all, you know, samples, uh, MIDI programming, and then just mixing it all in the box, which is... I've usually been kind of a fan of hardware, like hardware synthesizers and some hardware processors and things like that, because it just sound. I, I just like, I think hardware sounds better. I don't really have a great reason for this not being outside of the box. It was just very practical at the time because there were times where me and my family would be in Sweden visiting relatives and I would be sitting at their kitchen table, basically working on my music while they were sleeping, you know, with a sort of little... Korg mini uh, keyboard coming up but some of the melodies on that record were made actually at like two o'clock in the morning at my, my my wife's sister's house you know when they finally went to bed and i could have some quiet <laughs> you know just me with a laptop and a headset so, so it just remained in the box if you know what i mean and I, and I like the sound of it you know if i had been able to put it across a neve mixing desk or something some crazy shit like that it would have probably sounded much better but um, those days are over. I used to have access to a Neve desk, which is insane. And you seem to have a pretty ball. impressive uh, studio setup behind you here. Is this all stuff you've amassed over the years? Yeah, it's 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 just stuff you buy one piece at a time. It's not like I have a whole shitload of like cool studio equipment. I mean, I, I I've been buying a, some stuff like the last year or so. Before that, I actually didn't buy anything for a long, long time. I mean, there is more stuff, but you, you can't see it because it's basically sort of like behind you, I guess. But no, to answer the question, you know, it's just, just one, one, one item at a time. And sometimes I get a little silly. I just buy shit because I want it. And then it just ends up sitting there. <laughs> you know, I'm going to use mm-hmm. that thing one day. And then I feel like an idiot because, oh, shit, that thing cost like $1,000. And I bought it two years ago and I haven't used it yet. <laughs> I th- I think uh, we might know someone on this. On there's this a possibility. There's a gentleman like right that. over there. Well, that hey, might... look, <laughs> <laughs> do some of the same stuff. <laughs> I mean, I just I like the idea of owning it because at least it's in the room with me, and I can use it. Well, I'm I'm gonna use it one day, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's still some stuff around here that I haven't actually um, ran a lot of sound through yet or created something on. But I mean, it's it's gonna happen. <laughs> I just got to find the right place and the right music and the right sounds, you know, and things like that, but it'll happen. Now, have you considered at all bringing back something like Vond or Fata Morgana? The thought has crossed my mind, but there's so many things with Mortis I want to do right now. There's so many half finished pieces of music and pieces of, uh, you know, atmospherics, uh, for lack of a better expression, that I need, that I need to focus on. That just, just, just all that stuff in itself is actually kind of giving me nightmares because I feel like it's going to take me fucking five years just to go through all the little half finished things that I have now. You know, let alone oh, yeah. reanimating a couple of old side projects. I, and and I'm not sure if it's needed because Mortis has become a, a wider concept now you know it's not it's not just this one sound dealing with this one thing this this one conceptual thing you know which was that uh, parallel universe that i would always base my music on back in the old days it's not quite that narrow these days so what would have been bond music or fata morgana music i could easily get away with putting it out as mortise anyway so I kind of question the need for those projects now. But then again, I mean, I might change my mind about that in a year, you know, 
But that's exactly. off, off the top. That's my, that would be, those would be my feelings right now. I'm not sure if they're needed. You are working on new material for Mortis. That is that correct? Yeah. Is it going to be all new? Or are you looking at reworking some of the albums? What, are you, what is in your mind? What is going to be the next step recording wise for, for you? I'm in parallel working on both of the things you said. There are uh, songs that I'm redoing based upon the way they sounded live for the past few years, which were much angrier, much better, much heavier, and never released on record. You know, so so I've kept working on those and um, talking to a pretty cool producer. I'm not going to name drop anyone now because we're not, of course, we're not completely in the finishing line as far as nailing a, a deal. Don't want to jinx um, it. No, no. I think that's going to be fucking cool, though. And and then I'm working on what I would label brand new music, which is actually a collaboration. So it's not going to be an entirely mortis based project. I mean, I'm making a lot of the music, but that that's the uh, collaboration between me and Stefan Groot from Apoptigma Berserk and uh, Lorianne House. The, the singer is, is uh, going to be featured on a couple of songs. Sarah Jessel Divas is going to be in a few songs. And we're looking at a couple of other guest people. And right now it's about 10 songs. I mean, I've made like 75 minutes of music for that. I was actually recording some guide tracks for Lorianne about two hours ago. I'm in my studio now, as you know, and I'm just com- combining, you know, I'm trying trying to be useful. I'm here mostly for the interview because at home there's no peace and quiet with the kids and everything. So uh, but in the studio, you know, I can... <laughs> I can get shit done. So I try to combine. That's why I ask people for certain times to do things like this, because I know I can do other shit at the same time to be effective, you know? So do you tend to record at night at this point? No, it really varies because it's, it's just when I have the time and when I can do it. But, but what I recorded for her were just a vocal guide tracks. I mean, I, I sounded like a fucking dog. It was just, she wasn't really sure how certain words and melodies were going together. There were some lyrical things I wanted I wanted her to sing, not just choir stuff, but some uh, vocals with lyrics. And so I just recorded that. So, you know, she, she would know how to do it properly. My stuff sounded horrible. <laughs> uh, what do the kids think of the makeup? Have they seen you in the full Mortis outfit? Uh, they've seen photos and things like that, but they haven't been to any of the shows where I do that because I rarely play live in Norway. Anyway, but I mean, you know, they they see some of the videos on YouTube and and shit like that, and I, I think they they know that people, some people in certain scenes know who I am. I mean, I don't think they think that I'm super famous because I'm not, but but quite frankly, they don't seem to be that bothered by it. You know, I'm just this old dude with 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 a with graying hair. You know, <laughs> so um, it, they think it's cool, but I don't think they're too bothered by it.
Wow, this has been so great and exciting to get to talk mm. to you. Now, over on the Patreon, we are going to discuss Tangerine Dream a little bit more in depth and what an album that's really inspired you and something that's been with you for a long time. So we're going to over over on the Patreon, we're going to be hopping over there in a second and doing our extra noise extra segment. But for now, we've discussed your recording. Is there any even in the year future any shows that you're looking at lining up or is right now it's just everything's behind the scenes? No, no, no. I mean, as far as live shows, just just a pandemic hit, you know, around March of uh, 2020, I had just made it back home from the U.S. tour, which we right. got really lucky as far as that goes. I mean, I think about three or four weeks later, the world just shut down. So that tour could have easily never have happened. We had at that point, I was going to go out on tour with with Mayhem and in Europe for like a for a long tour for like, I don't know, like five weeks. That was supposed to have happened in the fall of 2020. And obviously, by that point, the world was was uh, just going insane, you know, with everything. And uh, so that has been that's gotten pushed back several times. And now it's um, for a while now, it's been pushed back to April and May of, uh, of 2022. So that European tour looks that still feels pretty realistic. From what I gather, the situation in the States isn't really that great in terms of the pandemic. It kind of comes and goes a little a little bit, I guess. Basically, yeah. Yep. Actually, I think Mayhem, they were supposed to play in the States about a month ago and had to cancel because I don't, yeah. I don't think they could make it over. Yeah, they haven't had a, a lot of luck. I think um, right after I returned home from my tour, I mean, Mayhem arrived in the States and I think they had to go back home. Like, I, th- I don't think they got to play a single show and had to go back home. So, so I think they, they looked at a, a lot of, um, a pretty big financial loss because, you know, just, just getting a tour off its feet before you even play a single show is, is, uh, is a big expense. You know, there's a lot of expenses there. You're not going to get those back, you know? And yeah. so the, the way to make your money is to start playing shows, you know? Once, once you have all your shows canceled, I mean, you know, you're in trouble. So I, I think they were struggling for a while there, but don't quote me on it. That's what I heard. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we're, so we've been, we've been, uh, we've had that tour kind of going on for a long time now, you know, and um, so it's set to happen in April and May. I don't know if we're taking it any other place than Europe. I mean, you know, I'm just excited to be part of the European version of it. So uh, beyond that, we'll have to see, you know, one, once we have that done, um, It'll be at least two years since I was in the States last. So I'm pretty sure we're going to start looking into that, you know, getting back over there. But um, or we might wait a little bit. I mean, I, I probably should have some some new music out before going out there. I don't want to tour the same album three times in the States. I did it twice. You know, that's kind of enough. So uh, we'll have to see. Excellent. And until then, we will, of course, put a link up for the Mortis Bandcamp, which is an excellent Bandcamp. He's got everything up there you got to go support directly as we've been saying especially just like you're saying more important now than ever when touring is not happening support artists directly one of the best band camps out there so we're of course going to have a link up for that you got it all up there almost all of it almost all of it (laughs) oh right right yeah yeah yeah. not every yeah oh pretty much everything nearly there's about 85% of everything will be up there. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, of course, put a yeah, link up everything there. Everything I own. That's exi- There you go. Exactly. Yeah. So we'll have a link up for that. Everyone go support directly. And thank you so much. This was an incredible talk. Thank you. Wow. Here's a song about a big fucking dick.
to Noise Extra. Noise Extra is brought to you by Chondritic Sound, a home to noise artists for over 17 years, by Verdant Weapons, maker of quality contact microphones and noise devices, and by our Patreon supporters. You can find our Patreon at patreon.com slash noise extra, and your support really helps. You can find us on Instagram at noise extra, on the web at noise extra.com, one E in those, and on Twitter at noise extra, with three A's at the end. Thank you for listening to us and to noise.